On the 25th of October 1999, the fourth episode of Walker with Dinosaurs, Giant of the Skies, was released. This episode takes place in the early Cretaceous period 127 million years ago, and starts in Brazil before travelling to southern North America and then Western Europe. Like the previous episode, Cruel Sea, there are accuracy problems related to the geological age of some animals not fitting with the episode's time setting, but it also features some very questionable inclusions in terms of geographical distribution. Whilst this is nothing new for this series, out of the six episodes, Giant of the Skies seems to have the most egregious accuracy issues, as a lot of liberties were taken with both the spatial and temporal setting of this episode as a whole. However, these don't detract from the episode's quality in my opinion, as this one has some of the best, if not the best, storytelling in the whole series. Without further ado, let's get into it. Giant of the Skies has arguably the most interesting opening, a flash forward to the end of the episode where we see the body of the titular Giant of the Skies lying dead in the shallows on a beach at sunset. The music for this episode is truly heart-wrenching, and I would say this episode is the most tragic of the bunch. This is a good way to quickly gain intrigue from the audience, as they wonder how he died as the narration gives some background on how spectacular he once was before the title appears. A very cool start indeed. The first scene takes place on a cliff coastline in Brazil, with the narration explaining how the movement of the continent is creating new seaways and coastlines. This coast is the breeding site for the pterosaur Tapijara. Although it is now classified as a different genus, Tupandactylus, the model looks very cool. The colours are incredibly striking, especially with the bright red head crest. And the design is fairly accurate, aside from the limb proportions being slightly off. They also exhibit sexual dimorphism, which I'm not sure is accurate. They may also have not lived near the coast, rather they were more inland pterosaurs, but it's still plausible they could congregate at the coast to breed. We are then introduced to the giant of the skies himself, Ornithochirus. However, like the Tapijara, it too has since been reclassified as another genus, Tropiognathus. Both the Tropiognathus and Tupandactylus had yet to evolve by the time of this episode's setting, sadly. The design is really good and accurate, the head especially has a brilliant looking animatronic. The only issues I could find anatomically would be that there just aren't enough pycnofibers, but overall this one has aged very well. The problem is that they state that it's the largest animal ever to fly, but this title belongs to other giant pterosaurs such as Quetzalcoatlus or Hatsagopteryx, so this animal is oversized. He is, of course, the main character of this episode, and we follow his migration from South America through North America to Europe, where he will breed. This road trip style of storytelling really sets this episode apart, as it allows the audience to see the scope of the Mesozoic world, and makes it seem fleshed out and believable, which could in turn lead viewers to interpret and speculate about what else is living around the globe in the early Cretaceous, and it's a joy to watch. Whilst there's no evidence for Tropiognathus being migratory, it's still plausible considering it is a flying animal, and that many birds today are migratory. As he sets off on his grand journey, the narration teases how this will be the last he ever makes, engaging the viewer further. The shots of the Ornithochiris flying over the sea are really impressive still to this day, but the most impressive shot in the entire series goes to the aerial shot of the Iguanodon herd as the Ornithochirus reaches North America. According to Tim Haynes on the behind the scenes excerpts on the DVD, this shot alone took a whole year to make as every individual dinosaur model and footprint had to be animated and accounted for. Incredible stuff. The Iguanodon also have now been reclassified as a new genus, Dakotodon. As there is little fossil evidence of Dakotodon, it is hard to say if it is an accurate representation of that taxa, but judging it as an Iguanodon, 
It is one of the most accurate models in the entire series, and I personally love the coloration with the dark brown highlighted by white stripes. The only issues I could really make out was its posture as the hips seemed to be too high and the front of the animal being too low as a result. But other than that, it is excellent. We are also introduced to Polacanthus, which follows the trend of animals in this episode now being reclassified as a new genus, in this case, Hopletosaurus. It's a similar case with the Dakotodon, as there is little fossil remains of Hopletosaurus, so judging it as a representation of Polacanthus, it is fairly good. However, the tail droops considerably when it should be held stiffer. It also appears to lack a beak, which nodosaurids like Polacanthus did have. I really like the settings of this episode. The beach on the edge of the forest is such a cool environment, and the following rain and fog just make it look even cooler. This rain, however, halts the migration of the Ornithochirus and forces him to take shelter. We then are shown a very impressive Iguanodon animatronic as it chews on plants, a unique adaptation so far unseen in the animal kingdom. This then brings us to the showcase of some of the first flowers and flower pollinating insects. I really appreciate scenes like this as they give especially important insight into the world of the dinosaurs and how it changes around them and how they adapt to it. As the weather clears, we get a grotesque yet intriguing practical effect in the form of giant prehistoric mites. Also, I still to this day wonder what these silhouetted pterosaurs are, but they lead to what is now considered an outdated theory, that large pterosaurs had to wait for the heat of the day to be high enough to take off by using heat thermals. This theory is now considered to be unrealistic, as pterosaurs are now thought to be very strong animals and therefore wouldn't need the assistance of thermals for takeoff. The same goes for this huge colony of pterosaurs here. I have no idea what genus they're meant to be or why they're there. Still, impressive how many models have been rendered on screen though. The narration explains that despite being huge, Ornith the Kyrus weighs very little, allowing him to fly. As he crosses the Atlantic Ocean, we see what is probably the least impressive creature in the series, the Plesiopleurodon. Not only is the model identical to the Lyplurodon from Cruel Sea, it is the exact same shot, just with a slightly duller colour palette. It also hadn't evolved yet by the time of the episode, so I really don't understand what it's doing here. As the Ornithochirus reaches Western Europe, we are introduced to another herd of Iguanodon accompanied by Apolacanthus. This time, however, they are true representatives of their respective genera. The Polacanthus looks basically identical to its North American counterpart, but the Iguanodon has a light green colour scheme with yellow highlights and dark brown stripes, very different to that of the Dakotodon. The environment is also very nice, with an open woodland and many hills surrounding a lake. However, this brings us to the most obviously misplaced animal in the series, the Utah Raptor. I don't think I need to explain why it's a bit questionable that Utah Raptors are living in England. They also would have been extinct by this time as well, so their inclusion does seem very odd. They also lack feathers, which we now know with confidence that they did have. And then we get yet another mystery pterosaur. My best guess would be Corchicephalus, as it lived at this time and place, but it could be anything. Regardless, the Ornithochirus steals the fish it just caught, and I like this display of behaviour, as animals will most often take the path of least resistance, and stealing food from weaker animals is often easier than finding your own. The following scene is very entertaining, as we see the pack of Utah raptors hunt a young iguanodon. Feathers aside, the model looks pretty accurate, but the head is very shrink-wrapped unfortunately. The colour scheme is very leopard-like, and a treat to the eyes. I do like that we see the first attempt at hunting fail, as this is very common in nature. I love the shot of the iguanodon herd reflected in the water of the lake, it's very nice. This is followed by a second attack from the raptors on the iguanodon. This time they are more successful. I like that they don't perpetuate the idea that raptors could disembowel their prey 
with their killing claws. I also like that they portray them as having a pecking order, with a younger raptor being fiercely put in his place by older animals. The hunt prompts the Ornithocyrus to leave, and we are introduced to Iberomasaurus. Sadly, they go unnamed in the episode, and they lived in Spain, not England. The wording of the narration is very important, as they are specifically called flying dinosaurs, which makes it very apparent to those unaware that birds are in fact living dinosaurs. The narration also explains how their wings are more resistant to damage than those of pterosaurs, and that they will eventually drive them to extinction. This is another theory that is now thought unlikely, as subsequent discoveries have shown that pterosaurs remain diverse until their extinction. There is no doubt in my mind that the scene of the tiny birds mobbing the giant pterosaur was meant to symbolise this. The Ornithocyrus at last reaches his breeding ground in Spain, where we see dozens of male Ornithocyrus already there, fiercely deterring our Ornithocyrus. They also represent them as sexually dimorphic, with females possessing no crests. Sadly, our Ornithocyrus slowly dies from heat stroke and starvation as the saddest music piece plays. It is genuinely very sad to see this animal we followed the entire episode pass away after such hardship. Finally, we see a juvenile feeding on his corpse as the narration states he has become food for the next generation. Giant of the Skies is a very entertaining episode. The globe trotting aspect really does make it a unique watch, but this does lead to some accuracy and geographical hiccups, with many animals not in the right place and time. But what ultimately pulls this episode through is the story. Following the old Ornithocyrus on his grand journey to his death is quite the spectacle, and seeing the world of dinosaurs around him on his travels is such a wonderful experience. I'm happy this episode focuses on pterosaurs, similar to how Cruel Sea focused on marine reptiles, both groups of animals that shared the Mesozoic with the dinosaurs, so I'm happy to see them both get some love and representation in media. Whilst I wouldn't say it's my favourite episode, Giant of the Skies is still incredibly entertaining and an engaging watch. Thank you so much for watching, click the link in the end card to see my review of a figure based on an animal that appeared in this episode, and we shall hopefully be reviewing Spirits of the Ice Forest soon. Thank you, bye bye now.